I, one of the most interesting findings in neuroscience in the last 75 years is that pleasure and pain are co-located. And that means that the same parts of the brain that process pleasure also process pain and they work like opposite sides of a balance. So when I do something pleasurable, I get a little hit of dopamine, my balance tips to the side of pleasure, but no sooner has that happened than my brain adapts to that process by downregulating my own dopamine and my own dopamine receptors. And one way to visualize that is these little neuroadaptation gremlins hopping on the pain side of my balance to bring it level again. But the thing about those gremlins is they like it on the balance. So they don't get off right when it's level. They stay on until my balance is tipped an opposite and equal amount to the side of pain. And that's the come down or the after effect or that moment of wanting a second piece of chocolate or one more video game or whatever it is. I am delighted to be joined by Dr. Anna Lemke. Anna is an American psychiatrist who is chief of the Stanford Addiction Medicine Dual Diagnosis Clinic at Stanford University. Anna was a specialist in the opioid epidemic in the US, the author of Drug Dealer MD, and Anna's new book, Dopamine Nation, Finding Balance in the Age of Indulgence, which was just released. Anna, I loved reading your book. Welcome to the show. Thank you for having me. I'm excited to be here. My pleasure. Honestly, I'm seriously excited about this conversation. I loved reading your book. But one of the things I wanted to start with um, was that one of the things that really struck out to me when I was reading your book was that um, you share very openly a lot of struggles that you have been through, that you go through in your life. And unlike other books that I've read on, um, you know, these subjects related to you know, dopamine and other, you know, neurochemicals, neurotransmitters, is that this isn't a book that I, I read and thought that this was written from like an ivory tower. You know, this was a very human book filled with uh, struggle, courage. And one of the things that I thought about was that to me, it seems almost a bit, I guess, taboo for most people to think that doctors or psychologists or even psychiatrists would struggle with the things, I guess, that they treat. Did you worry about opening up about your own struggles? Not necessarily with the Twilight books, <laughs> but yeah. in your own writing. Yeah, you know, it's funny. I've done a lot of podcasts so far, and you are the first person who has asked me that question. And it's a question I have been expecting and hoping that somebody would ask. So I'm, I'm glad you asked it. And the answer is... Uh, I've exper I experienced a lot of anxiety about disclosing, you know, my own problems, my own neuroses, my own minor addictions, as I do in the book, precisely because of what you're saying. You know, I'm a doctor. I work at Stanford. I think there's this idea, you know, that doctors as healers can't possibly have their own problems um, because how could somebody with their own problems help other people? Um, you know, there. Definitely, if you like read books written by doctors, they almost never talk about um, having their own problems, that they're always, um, you know, often humble, but not necessarily troubled. So, uh, you, you know, this is a departure, I think, from, from other books written by doctors. I'll tell you the reason that I did it. I mean, there are, there are several important reasons, but the, the top ones are number one, um, as you know, my book also discusses in vivid and graphic detail the problems of my patients. And I asked my patients to share their stories and I didn't change any of the details except their names and some minor demographics. And that took an act of courage for them to do that. And so I felt it really would have been hypocritical for me not to also have the courage to share my own struggles. Also, as I write about in the book, in the chapter on radical honesty, I really do think that this kind of transparency is important for a lot of reasons. I think that we can help other people when we're honest about our own brokenness and our own suffering, um, contrary to the kind of instinctive feeling that we have that people will turn away from us when we you know, show our warts. In fact, the opposite often happens that people feel closer to us and not so alone uh, in their own in their own suffering. 
So those are, you know, those are the reasons that I decided it would be worthwhile communicating my own, my own minor addictions and my own struggles. Because um, I guess in a way, what I'm also trying to do is sort of break down this conventional wisdom around uh, psychotherapy and the stance of the psychotherapist that they're never to disclose anything. I think with, with you know, thoughtful consideration, self-disclosure on the part of the therapist can actually be really healing and helpful for patients. And I do practice that in my work. And what has been the reaction that you found clinically when you, as you say, open up and share those struggles? Have you noticed improvements? Yeah, you know, so I think the initial reaction is sort of a shock and surprise. And then once they sort of settle into it, I think, you know, I, they feel very grateful, right? They're, they're not alone. I mean, one anecdote that's not in my book that comes to mind is um, a patient of mine who came to see me for his flying phobia. And he told me that he always sits next to the window because if he can see the ground somehow that, you know, that, that makes him feel less afraid. That's completely irrational. He knows, but that's how, he, and I said to him, oh my gosh, I can totally relate. Me too. Like I always have to get the window seat and his eyes sort of popped open. I think there was this moment of terror when he thought, get me out of here. I have a crazy psychiatrist who's not going to be able to help me. But, you know, then he sort of like was okay. And yeah, I mean, he got better. I love it. I love it. You kind of just mentioned a few uh, details there about uh, your own, I guess, clinical journey and your journey with your patients. And chapter one in particular was very, very hard hitting. And I think that it was very necessary to kind of really understand the uh, the psychology and the biology and the struggle and all these things. But I would love to know, why are your patients your heroes? Ah, my patients are my heroes because of the tremendous courage required for recovery from addiction. And these are really, um, you know, the, un the unsung heroes of the modern age. What, what, what people with severe addictions have to give up and have to go through in order to get into recovery is just, it's mind boggling. I, I mean, I, I don't think I could do it. Let me put it to you that way. Mm. Um, and so when, when I see what they achieve through incredible dedication, hard work, and a tremendous leap of faith, I'm, I'm really just in awe of them. Also, I've learned a lot from them. You know, I mean, really the book is sort of like you know, the wisdom that I've learned from my patients that I want to pass on to others because they've taught me so much. Is it fair to say as well that, that the, uh, I guess, psychology and the manifestations of an addict really gives you a clear, uh, you know, a first person insight of to really what the human condition can be like that most people just don't see? Right. So that's exactly one of the sort of points of Dopamine Nation is that we're all vulnerable to this problem of compulsive overconsumption. People with addiction are just especially vulnerable. So they represent an extreme example of what we're all capable of. And so by looking at how they solve this problem in the modern age, we can all um, you know, gain wisdom and insight into how, how to handle our own compulsive overconsumption. That, that is the entire premise of the book. So yes, you're right. Um, I love it. I love it. Um, I figured this would be a good place to jump into uh, the wonderful neurotransmitter dopamine. Um, I feel like uh, people throw the term around very, uh, very casually these days, you know, like they get a like on Instagram, oh, look at all the dopamine I've got, and then, you know, et cetera, et cetera. <laughs> and what really opened my eyes to uh, dopamine was when I read uh, the Molecule of More by uh, Daniel Lieberman. Um, Andrew Huberman, when he was on the podcast, he recommended that book and I read it. I thought it was a really, really interesting book. Um, I guess, what is the role that dopamine plays? Well, dopamine is very important to the experience of pleasure, reward, and especially motivation. And motivation may be even more fundamental to the role of dopamine than even pleasure. And the sort of classic um, animal experiment showing that is that if you engineer a rat to have no dopamine um, and you put food in the rat's mouth, it will eat the food and it will seem to enjoy that experience. But if you put food just a body length away from the rat 
it will not move toward the food to eat it. It will starve to death, which is, you know, sort of the kind of a nice um, metaphor really for the function of dopamine. It is involved in the experience of pleasure, but even more so involved in the experience of reward to go seek out motivation and reward to, to go seek out those pleasurable experiences. Um, yeah, right. And, and one thing that I was thinking about in terms of dopamine is that, as you said, but it's about seeking out things. And I guess these things are external to us. It puts us in a state of, I guess, exteroception of seeking things beyond what's inside us. Does this differ from serotonin, which I guess puts us in a state of interoception of things inside us? Yeah, that's a nice way to think about it. I mean, they're both monoamine neurotransmitters. Um, they both, you know, I mean, serotonin is also um, associated with the experience of pleasure and reward, but you're right. It doesn't, as far as we know, contribute considerably to the experience of like motivation and seeking. It's more fundamentally related to this feeling of expansiveness and social connection. Mm -hmm. um, and so in some ways you could argue that if with a, with a kind of flooding of serotonin, we might even be less motivated potentially um, because we're sort of, you know, it's sort of like the Buddha, the Buddha neurotransmitter, just sort of your very <laughs> zen. Um, whereas as dopamine is really this, um, this sort of motivation neurotransmitter. Interesting, interesting. And I would love to, I guess, um, kind of pick up on this point just about dopamine because you talk uh, very eloquently and something I'd never considered was that uh, when we get a hit of dopamine, and I feared you talked about the um, various levels of things which can release amounts of dopamine, chocolate, sex, amphetamine, all these other things. And, and it's really interesting to see the types of things, the, how much it releases. But you talk about how when we do get a hit of dopamine, that it knocks us out of homeostasis. And then this requires some element of pain to bring us back. Uh, could you elaborate on this about how it's kind of like a seesaw between pleasure and pain? Sure. So one of the most interesting findings in neuroscience in the last 75 years is that pleasure and pain are co-located. And that means that the same parts of the brain that process pleasure also process pain and they work like opposite sides of a balance. So when I do something pleasurable, I get a little hit of dopamine, my balance tips to the side of pleasure. But no sooner has that happened than my brain adapts to that process by downregulating my own dopamine and my own dopamine receptors. And one way to visualize that is these little neuroadaptation gremlins hopping on the pain side of my balance to bring it level again. But the thing about those gremlins is they like it on the balance. So they don't get off right when it's level. They stay on until my balance is tipped an opposite and equal amount to the side of pain. And that's the come down or the after effect or that moment of wanting a second piece of chocolate or one more video game or whatever it is. Now, if we wait long enough, the gremlins hop off, you know, normal dopamine transmission, baseline tonic levels are restored and that balance is level. But if we continue to ingest that substance or that behavior repeatedly, what ends up happening is that our brain sort of learns that substance and the initial response on the pleasure side gets weaker and shorter and the after response on the pain side gets stronger and longer. And this is often referred to as tolerance, but it's not just tolerance. It's also ultimately changing our set point for, for the experience of pleasure and pain. We end up with so many gremlins on the pain side of the balance camping out there that we essentially are walking around in psychological pain and in some ways physical pain and need to use, hence the compulsion to use, not to get high, but just to feel normal. And when we're not using, it's very difficult for us to experience pleasure in other rewards. So this idea that pleasure seeking or hedonism ultimately leads to anhedonia or the absence of pleasure. Yeah, I definitely want to uh, chat to you about anhedonia, but it's a really interesting point. And I guess that explains why if someone's never drunk coffee before, one cup can be 
psychedelic, but three months down the line, they need four or five. Uh, a 15 year old uh, could get off to a music video, but then five years later, he needs extreme pornography to get off. Right. Someone right. taking ecstasy tablets might need five or six. It's as you said, it's like it builds up like a tolerance to it, right? Right. Yeah. And as I write about in the book, I mean, I, you know, I experienced that myself with, with romance novels, right? I started with a teenage romance, the Twilight Saga, really pretty <laughs> innocent. And, you know, I don't know, a year or two into it, I was reading like sadomasochistic erotica, which is not my, you know, fantasy. Let's say that's not my typical um, predilection. But what happened was I essentially became, became tolerant to sort of these um, you know, milder versions. And then I needed more and more potent versions to get the same effect. And, and so, you know, my preferences changed and progressed over time, not unlike the way that somebody starting out, you know, using Oxycontin might, might ultimately end, end up, you know, injecting heroin. It's the same, same phenomenon. Right. And I had a similar, um, a similar experience with my my best friend Lewis, who who is one of the uh, hosts too, and it ended up this one summer we ended up climbing this this mountain here in Wales where I am, and it was like the highest mountain in Wales. And then I said, "Tell you what, we need to go and climb the highest mountain in the UK." <laughs> and then no sooner we did that, I remember I was driving over and I went, "We need to go and climb Mount Everest." Yeah, right. And a, and a few months later, we're on a flight to Kathmandu. And we're at Everest Base Camp. And then we're coming back from camp, from uh, Nepal. And I said, we need to go and climb Kilimanjaro. Thankfully, <laughs> <laughs> COVID struck and, and blew those plans out the water. But I remember actually being in like the Himalayas. And as you said, at this point, and my mind was just solely focused on right. getting to the end point. Mm-hmm. And, and I said, I said, and I remember like thinking there, I was like, there's a difference between the people who that are interested in the Nepalese culture, in the yaks, mm. in the tea huts, in the language, in the be- the awe-inspiring beauty of the Himalayas. And me that was just on a, a man-obsessed mission mm. of mm. touching down. So mm. I would love to, I guess, like fire this back and say, what is the psychology of someone that is addicted to, to something? Mm. What, what is the uh, psychology of that? Well, I mean, the fundamental psychology is that this this pleasure pain balance which is in a very primitive part of our brain um you know in 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 the limbic brain or the emotion brain deep in the brain stem phylogenetically conserved over millions of years of evolution unchanged across species it's the same that brain that part of our brain is exactly the same as it is in the lizard right it's the lizard brain and it's a very powerful mechanism and it essentially you know, in the process of becoming addicted, get, gets a, a life of its own. And when we're in it, we don't see it. So um, w- whether it's me with my romance novels or, or you literally climbing mountains, um, you get so, so that you don't even self, you're not able to observe objectively anymore. I mean, it sounds like you had some self-awareness, but I wonder if that was while you were climbing Everest or while you were in Nepal, or if it was really later after you looked back and my guess would be that it was really later that it took Mm. a break from doing that for you to be able to fully see kind of the mind state that you were in but what essentially happens is that our 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 lizard brain or our reward pathway ends up being the sole driver of our motivations and our choices and becomes you know probably literally disconnected from the prefrontal cortex which is that you know, big gray matter region right behind our foreheads that's so important for future planning, decision-making, storytelling. Now, when things are working out healthily, our prefrontal cortex and our reward pathway and our limbic brain are talking to each other. And there's quite a lot of, you know, back and forth. And, um, well, you know, I, I tried this and I had this experience, and but then I had these consequences. And so maybe that's not a good idea to do that again or, what you know, whatever it is. Um, but, but when we get in our addictions, we, we, we are, th- those connections with the prefrontal cortex essentially get cut off and we're just in lizard brain um, and just, you know, being, being guided by these, these re- the f- reflexive pull of our desires, which essentially, again, 
ultimately leads to a pain, pleasure, pain, balance, tilted to the side of pain. So we're now driven to pursue our drug of choice because when we're not doing it, we're craving and we're irritable and we're anxious and we're depressed. We need to keep doing it just to feel normal. Do you think that, I guess, someone with um, these addictive compulsions, that they have a mindset of kind of like, maybe this world is too mundane or there's just too much drudgery in modern life? That Do you think that that's possible? Oh, absolutely. So I mean, as I talk about in the book, one of the big problems contributing to compulsive overconsumption for all of us is not just the ubiquity, potency, and novelty of addictive drugs and behaviors, but also the fact that we have so much more time and we really don't know what to do with it. You know, not only do we have more days because we are living longer, but we also have more time in any given day. We have more leisure time than humans have ever had before. Um, we have approximately four hours of leisure time compared to two hours of leisure time 100 years ago. And we're projected to have up to seven or eight hours of leisure time in rich countries um, you know, in the, in the near future. So it really does beg the question, you know, what, what do we do with all of this time? So far, it looks like what we're doing is entertaining ourselves to death, um, which is not working out very well for us. And I think we're going to have to rethink that. Um, but, but it is a big problem. And I think in particular, people who are vulnerable to addiction are people who may find this world especially boring and are people who just temperamentally need more friction and need more of a challenge in life and if they can't find it then the addictive process sort of fills that vacuum for them right and as you talk about in the book we are motivated to seek pleasure and to avoid pain and i i feel like the scales have tipped so heavily as, as you say but they in the seeking pleasure and it took me back to a conversation that i remember we had very early on the show and um the guy was talking about uh that he'd received this relationship advice and it was something to the extent of if you uh have an argument with your the person you're dating or in a relationship with in the first 12 months that that was simply off the table and you know you should break up immediately uh, it was a sign of incompatibility and it made me think that, as we said, that life is really filled with so much uh, mundanity, drudgery, you know, routine. Um, but now it seems like everywhere you go, we're constantly promised a pill or a potion that can relieve us of our humanness. And I was thinking that while that seems to be the common narrative about escaping, you know, our humanness, to me, it seems like a paradox because it's like if we do embrace the uh, the routine, the feelings of being alive, that actually it makes things more pleasurable. Do you think that my hypothesis there has any uh, any weight? Oh yeah, for sure. So I mean, you know, again, the paradox of this pleasure-seeking world that we live in is that it ultimately makes us more miserable, and <laughs> and there's a neurobiological explanation for that. We actually reset our dopamine thresholds with the relentless suit of pleasure. So of course, the corollary to that is to stop seeking pleasure and to actually intentionally seek out challenging situations, or at least tolerate you know, what is our human existence, which is for the most part, you know, pretty hard. Um, and then ironically, um, when we do that, we will be able to experience in between and not necessarily at our, um, you know, at our timing, a moments of, of really um, intense pleasure and well-being, but, you know, they'll come unbidden. Um, so it's, I mean, one, one of the me metaphors that I sometimes think of is, you know, we have to stop pursuing that pot of gold at the end of the rainbow and instead just enjoy the rainbow and the rainbow doesn't come when we want it to that's the tricky part because uh, you know part of what we've all learned to do is to control the way we feel and to be able to change the way we feel in the moment and we all expect that we should be able to do that and we really aren't very skilled or we've forgotten how to just sort of tolerate um you know being in the moment and I think that that's really a central point here because, you know, we, there's a lot of like mantras 
um, like, you know, the, you know, par partially, um, you know, imported from like Zen Buddhism and such that we just need to be in the moment and be here now. And, you know, for the longest time, I thought, well, what's wrong with me? Because I, I don't somehow seem able to do that. And, and the reason I, I finally realized that, that I thought I wasn't doing it right was because I, whenever I was like in the moment, I was like, wow, this sucks. Um, <laughs> <laughs> right. I thought, okay, I'm not doing it right. But, but, but in fact, that is right. You know, cause being in the moment is like, yeah, this is not great, but here we are. And so it, really the, the mission then becomes to be in the moment and tolerate that it sucks and not try to change it. Right. And that's a great example because in the moment you have to deal with uncomfortable feelings, yeah. restlessness, listlessness. Are there any other examples of, uh, I guess, pain-seeking activities uh, that you particularly enjoy, which I guess can tip the, the scales back? Yeah. So that's, that's a, you know, a whole, a whole chapter in the book sort of postulates that, hey, if repeatedly pressing on the pleasure side ultimately tilts our balance to the side of pain. Is it possible that pressing on the pain side will tilt our balance to the side of pleasure and reset our pleasure pathways in that direction? And, and it looks like that actually may be the case. So for example, exercise, which we know is immediately toxic to cells, um, leads in an opponent process or after effect way to the release of dopamine, norepinephrine, serotonin, and does so in a sustainable way over time, even with repeated exposures. So we don't, we may, we may develop some tolerance uh, to that, but typically we don't. Typically um, that's a kind of um, secondary pleasure that is enduring. And so probably a much better way to get dopamine. Other examples are cold, cold water bath immersion, very painful, but uh, studies have shown that it, um, it elevates uh, dopamine and other neurotransmitters for hours afterwards in an enduring way. Wow. Um, and then just generally, you know, I advocate for engaging in um, intellectually challenging activities, creative activities, anything really that's effortful. Of course, I do warn that we can also get addicted to, to pain, right? And in a way, your mountain climbing might have actually been more in that category because that's effortful and painful and hard, especially when you're climbing Mount Everest and can't breathe. <laughs> um, but you know, but what we add, what you have there is, if you tilt the pain to the pain side too much and too fast, you essentially trigger your your body's uh, fight or flight mechanisms. You get a surge of adrenaline, and although it's you know, reinforcing because the body will compensate immediately by releasing, for example, our own endogenous endorphins or opioids. Um, what ends up happening is that we can then get addicted to that, develop tolerance to that, and end up in, in that same compulsive loop. Right. So, the, the, so the recommendation then is for mild to moderate amounts of pain, um, not, you know, extreme uh, adrenaline seeking types of pain. Interesting. Interesting. I love I love that point. Um, I would love to, I guess, actually pick up on your work because I'm really interested in uh, psychiatry. And I was thinking to myself, um, just when I was, I guess, going through the book and I guess in how you would uh, diagnose things. Am I right in saying that as a psychiatrist, you're one of the principal ways in which you would, I guess, diagnose someone is through the use of their language? Right. Yes, absolutely. So there's even a concept in psychiatry for this. We talk about not just the content of thought, but the form of thought. And what we mean by that essentially is um, a person's language, how they narrate their experience. Um, for example, people with schizophrenia often um, engage in what's called pronominal reference. And by that, I mean that they'll start talking about people as if I know who those people are you know, as if somehow I'm privy to the complex um, construct of their mental um, imagery and thoughts, which of course I'm not, but because they feel like people are putting thoughts in their head or taking thoughts out of their head, they think I have access to that. So that, that's just one minor example of what we'll see, for example, in the case of schizophrenia. Right. I, and I guess this would differ to, I guess, other fields. For instance, a cardiologist could probably see very clearly i guess what's going on but i i don't know unless i'm mistaken i don't think there is i guess a blood test 
or a brain scan that you could take to diagnose someone with depression. So it is. That's, that's yeah. absolutely right. Yes. There's no blood test. There's no brain scan. If somebody told you otherwise, they're selling you a bill of goods. We're not there yet. A psychiatric diagnosis is based entirely on what we call phenomenology. And that just means observable patterns of behavior that are maladaptive, that repeat themselves across different people from different demographics, different cultures, and, and I mean, and, and represent an underlying brain disease. I mean, so, so again, what's interesting is um, if we take addiction or schizophrenia or eating disorders, you can go to, uh, you know, different cultures across the world and find people with very, very similar um, patterns of behavior uh, that representing those discrete psychiatric illnesses. Um, and, and it, it really is, you know, remarkable when you see that the brain is an organ like any other that can be diseased in these, in these, um, you know, somewhat predictable ways. Can you diagnose addic addiction with a blood test or a brain scan? No, 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 you don't. There's nothing, no mental illness has, has a brain scan or a blood test. I mean, certainly there are a lot of people working on that, but there's nothing diagnostic that can do that. It's really just getting information from the patient, from others, um, to understand patterns of behavior, patterns of thought, patterns of emotion, um, and, and to identify those patterns as consistent with or not a given psych psychiatric illness. Interesting. I do think that a blood test or a brain scan would be able to, I guess, diagnose in the future uh, addiction or depression or anxiety. Do you think that is something which could happen? I think so, but I think it's far off. Far off. Yeah, because the brain is so complex and we're even now just mapping out the interconnected neural networks between different parts of the brain. Originally, people were looking at discrete regions, um, for example, you know, I mean, fMRI images and trying to see, well, you know, geez, the hippocampus is smaller in this subset and it's, you know, larger in that subset or whatever. But at the end of the day, it's not probably not about size or morphology. It's going to be about um, neurons firing together or not. And so before we can diagnose pathology, we're probably going to have to understand the way that neurons talk to each other in the brain. And that's a pretty long way off, although a huge area of active research and really exciting. Interesting. Interesting. And I would love to, I guess, ask you, um, in terms of the work which you do, you detail some of the conversations that you have uh, with your patients and your own struggles and their struggles in the book. Uh, you have a very uh, empathic, very compassionate nature to, to yourself, if I say so myself. I'm really interested in um, the art of having difficult conversations. And I would love to know how you approach a conversation with a patient or a client that requires you to both be empathic and compassionate, but also direct and to the point. Yeah, and that's a skill that I've honed over time because you're right, it's a very important skill. Um, you know, how do we um, how do we empathize, express empathy, build that therapeutic connection, but also um, tell our patients the truth and reflect back to them the reality of what we think about their situation, which is so important today because there are, I think, fewer and fewer opportunities for people to get real feedback for many different reasons um, um, having to do with the way the world is now. Um, we often don't get real feedback from those around us. And one of the ways that I've learned to do this is to actually express what I'm thinking as a question, um, which I think communicates a, my genuine humility about um, what I can and can't know about what's going on in somebody else's head. So I might say to a patient, First of all, I will um, try as much as often to reflect back to them what they've said to me uh, so that they know that I've heard and understood. This, this, uh, this point cannot be minimized. It's really essential. We all have a desperate desire to be heard and understood. And when we are understood, it is very cathartic. So for example, you, you read my book, I sense you understood what I was trying to say. That's very gratifying to me, you know, more gratifying than really anything else connected to the book. Um, and, and everybody feels that way. We all, we all want to be understood. 
And so there's the first that reflection back, like, I think this is what you said. Did I understand that? Yes, you did. Or no, you didn't, you know, you didn't get the speech right. Okay. Now, now I'm at a place that, you know, I understand. And then, then there's the questions. Gee, I, I wonder if blah, 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 you know, or when you say that it really makes me think about blah, 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 blah. So a kind of like a humble wondering aloud is a stance that I have found um, to be helpful because it's also a true stance. It's like, I don't know for sure. This is what came up in my brain when you were talking. I wonder what you think about it. Let's, let's talk about it. Right. And it also shows genuine curiosity because we're so quick to come to assumptions about someone else's intentions or their desires. Uh, yeah, I completely agree. That's a, a, a wonderful skill. Um, I, I would love to ask you about mobile phones. Um, obviously, you were in the social dilemma. Um, I noticed that you're not on social media, which I, I am full of admiration for. <laughs> <laughs> I'm full of admiration for it. Um, if I came to you um, in your clinic and I said, look, I've got all these symptoms. I can't go a day without my phone. Um, I can't sleep with it outside of my room, which unfortunately mostly true. Uh, but it's also highly adaptive for my life. Okay. Um, you know, if I, they, they would be, I would imagine great social costs for me, not having my phone around to text, to email, to do these other things. Would it be possible then if it doesn't affect me socially or professionally, even if I may, in theory, have uh, addictive behaviors to it, to get a clinical diagnosis for that phone? Yeah, I think that's a great question. And again, I, I, I would say I would not jump in to judge because it's all going to be about cost-benefit analysis. You know, are, are the benefits of your phone use still outweighing the potential costs to you? And, you know, if we can be very certain that, that the benefits outweigh the costs, then it's not may maybe necessary for you to change anything in your life. But as we were talking about before, one of the insidious aspects of getting into this vortex of compulsive overuse is that we don't really see the harms when we're in it, which is why I do recommend this dopamine fast. Um, not just because it allows our dopamine to reset itself so that we can sort of experience and find other parts of our lives rewarding, but it also allows us to see true cause and effect in a way that we really can't when we're in it. So um, for people for whom, you know, their phone is just kind of a 24 seven, you know, tapping and swiping, other people have commented that they're on it too much. They've wondered if they're on it too, too much. I do recommend a, a dopamine fast, a period of total abstinence away from that device, maybe as part of a planned holiday where you would communicate to all of your people that you're not going to be available. So you don't have to be worried that people will think, you know, something horrible happened to you, but they know that you're taking a planned break and then really be very serious about, um, not touching it even a single time in that period. And whether that period is one day or one week or one month, I'm just really committing to abstinence and then observing in ourselves what we go through mentally uh, during that period. Because I think what many people will describe is actual physical symptoms of withdrawal, including mm -hmm. anxiety, irritability, restlessness, um, compulsive, intrusive thoughts about the phone, about who might be contacting them, about what they're missing. But if you can get through that initial withdrawal, and the gremlins hop off the pain side of the balance and homeostasis is restored, many times people will feel that they are actually happier without constantly engaging in their phones. And they'll also then reassess whether or not the phone is as necessary as they thought it was. So I think that's a key piece too. You know, we can, we can tell ourselves it's so necessary for our work or our social life, but with some distance, we may actually um, reevaluate that. Right. And, then when, and then when people go back to using, they can they try, can try to use in a different way. Right. And I've had many experiences in my life where I've never thought I could be addicted to something until I've actually tried to stop it. Right. And I remember I had an experience a few years back where I said, for whatever reason, I thought I'm just going to completely cut my pornography use. Uh, and it was 
and I, I never thought that it was a problem and it turns out it was hell yeah. like it was yeah. literal hell I remember I've yeah. I've gone through breakups where suddenly you no longer speak to the person anymore and it's like yeah. the, the symptoms even with coffee I, yeah. I was like as I'm going to withdraw myself and suddenly right. I'm like what's going on you know wh- why do I feel so lethargic why am I shaking why am I getting headaches yeah <laughs> Well, thank you so much for sharing that about the pornography, because, you know, the reason that I lead with the case of sex addiction in my book is because this is really a huge and under discussed problem um, that that so many people are ashamed to admit to may not even be aware that that it's contributing to their overall unhappiness. And yet, you know, yeah, it's it's a it can be a physiologic addiction. Um, so, you know, good for you for sort of seeing, seeing it for what it was and um, trying this, you know, a period of abstinence in order to kind of, you know, get that insight. Right, right. And, and is, uh, I guess, sex addiction, th- this was something I was wondering, pornography, sex addiction, does this differ to other addictions? Because something like, uh, I guess, alcohol use, to my knowledge, there's no biological drive to for me to go and you know drink a bottle of vodka but in terms of sex there are physiological needs is there a difference there? is that is that what makes it so hard or do you think that it, addiction is just a an umbrella type of thing i'm i'm curious what you think yeah about that. yeah no i mean i i mean i i think that ultimately you know all addictions um follow the same natural history people start out using for fun or to solve a problem they repeat that behavior because it's fun or it solves a problem. Over time, they need more and more to get the same effect. And then eventually, if they tip their balance chronically to the side of pain, they end up in this compulsive vortex where they're using uh, because it's the only thing that makes them feel good and they need to use just to kind of maintain homeostasis. Um, but, but you're right, there are distinct differences between, for example, you know, drinking alcohol and um, using orgasm in whatever form, but both, you know, both in different ways do lead to this, you know, a sudden chemical flooding of these um, feel-good neurotransmitters. And so, um, you know, ultimately um, work in, in very similar ways. In terms of the underlying physiologic drive for sex, I mean, we have so many physiologic drives, right? Um, when we have a physiologic drive to move, you know, we were evolutionarily designed to walk tens of kilometers a day. We don't do that anymore. Um, there are many sort of physiologic, we are physiologically driven to seek out, you know, things to eat. We don't really need to do that anymore either. We just need to, you know, whatever, uh, use our app and order it to the door. So, I mean, I, I, I theorize that one of the reasons we're so preoccupied with sex is because it may be the last sort of bastion of our innate physiologic drives, the last way that we are actually in our bodies because we're so disconnected from our bodies now. So I'm not sure I would hold you know that drive up above others, but I think it has become preeminent just because of the way we live now. Right, and another thing, you know, I'm, I'm so sorry to, to make this, about myself and, and I'll, oh, I'll, 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 send an, way, <laughs> I'll send you an invoice. That way, trust me. I'll send you I'll send you an invoice at the end. Um, <laughs> but one thing as well that I noticed is that and, and potentially in an adaptive way, this was one of the reasons why I started this podcast, because I could have these conversations. Yeah. What if someone has someone that may, you know, have my name, have uh, a compulsion for very intense relationships? Could that be a uh, uh, could that be could that be uh, clinically diagnosed? Oh, not only just clinically diagnosed, it's a well-known phenomenon, which is why there are twelve-step groups like Alcoholics Anonymous for love addiction. It's a mm. real deal. A lot of women actually struggle with this kind of repeatedly seeking out um, these love relationships, basically as a way to manage their own psychological suffering by essentially using another person to, uh, you know, modulate their dopamine in the process of falling in love and falling in love absolutely releases dopamine. I mean, men are not immune to this problem either. Usually for men, sex is also a big part of it. There's also 12 step groups for sex and love addiction. Um, those folks for whom they're, they're sort of tied together where the chase and the conquest is just as important, if not more important than the actual sexual act itself. But no, there's, this is absolutely the case. And of course, our culture actively promotes this, you know, this sort of, um, this sort of romantic notion 
Um, and, and then these sort of verklempt relationships that, that some of us can get into. So yeah, this is a, this is a, an area of vulnerability for some people. Right. And, and in my own life, I've had conversations with people that I've been dating or in relationships with, or even friends. I even, even I felt this with my mother where I've had a conversation with her and I, and I felt at the end of the conversation that was, I don't feel connected enough from that conversation. Mm -hmm. I don't feel as close as I want to feel. Mm -hmm. Like, it's just, it's like, I, I can't yeah. even like explain it. It's, it's like so weird, like feeling no, like that. No, 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 not a weird at all. I mean, basically what that says is for you, intimacy is very rewarding. Yeah. You're an intimacy guy. Um, and we absolutely know that um, intimacy releases dopamine. My colleague, Rob Malenka, just discovered a couple of years ago that oxytocin, the love hormone, actually binds to dopamine receptors or uh, dopamine neurons in the reward pathway and, and causes those neurons to release dopamine. So, and, and the, whole, the whole thing about social media is, is exactly that. I mean, social media has essentially <clears throat> drugified you know, human connection. Um, and, and turned it into something that's highly potent and, and potentially highly addictive. Not that all social media is bad, but just that it can become become a drug. And this this wanting deep human connections, which you know, on the in essence, is a healthy and adaptive thing. Um, but like anything, if taken too far, can can cause us needless suffering. Yeah, definitely. I, I love that <laughs> point. And, and I it got me thinking that, like, for myself uh, personally. I would imagine that um, the way that I've, I guess, you know, channeled these tendencies uh, in societal uh, views has been uh, very adaptive through, I guess, you know, climbing uh, Mount Everest or, you know, building a podcast or uh, academic or whatever else has been. Um, but I noticed that quite easily that could have turned into another way. Even if I go on like a night out with my friends, I noticed that I've, I'm an all or nothing type of guy, you know, I, right. one pint, I, I can't just have one pint. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> it's all or nothing. So it got, it's got me thinking, um, and you, you talk about this in the book, what is the genetic basis of uh, addiction? Well, first of all, there is most likely a genetic basis because we know from family studies that if you have a biological parent or grandparent with addiction, whether or not they were around when you were growing up and influenced you, you are um, at an increased risk compared to the general population of becoming addicted yourself. So there's a, a heritable component, which probably constitutes about 50 to 60% wow. of the risk, which is quite high when you look at um, the heritable risks of mental illnesses across the board. So, so there's, there's that piece. What it actually amounts to, we don't know. It's most certainly polygenic and complex and may have something to do with a combination of um, a tendency toward impulsivity and emotion dysregulation and inability to delay gratification um, combined with, um, um, you know, may maybe a, a kind of innate uh, decreased dopamine levels. And so kind of innate more reward seeking, um, trying to kind of get those dopamine levels up. So those are some of the some of the hypotheses out there, right? So almost certainly that is uh, biopsychosocial, the heavy biological um, component. You mentioned earlier uh, anhedonia. Th now this this is a, a phenomenon which which absolutely fascinates me. What is going on in the brain there in terms of dopamine? Yeah. So when we're anhedonic or unable to take joy in anything we're essentially in a dopamine deficit state. So our dopamine is constantly firing at tonic baseline levels. Um, but if we pursue pleasure relentlessly, our brain will compensate by essentially um, bringing it down to below baseline levels. And again, this is this pleasure pain balance or the, the, the opponent process mechanism. Um, and, and so anhedonia is just that state of being in, you know, in dopamine deficit. Um, and not having um, our dopamine levels, you know, at, at their healthy baseline. And, and is that caused by too much dopamine? Yeah. So that's essentially, you know, one of the causes that, that if we have uh, too much dopamine released for too long in our brains, our, it's overwhelming. Our brains were not 
evolutionarily designed for that, right? It's the mismatch between our primitive brain and the world we live in now. And so our brains will compensate by essentially putting us into a dopamine deficit state. Uh, more about uh, <laughs> the role of uh, dopamine in depression. Yeah, so that's a great question. And that has been looked at. Um, there are studies showing that people who are more prone to depression, even in the absence of uh, drug and alcohol use, for example, um, are people who have lower um, baseline levels of dopamine firing. Um, so so there, that, that has been examined and there are some, you know, some data suggesting that, that, that those inter-individual differences um, may exist with regards to baseline levels of dopamine and, and it also may explain why people with mental illness are at increased risk for developing addiction. So, so fascinating. I, I absolutely love talking about this stuff. Um, one of the things that you talk about in the book, which I, uh, it was kind of very sobering to read and that was uh, the chapter you dedicate to truth telling. And I would love to know why is it so important to tell the truth? So truth telling is really interesting to me because over 25 years of seeing patients with addiction who get into recovery from addiction, the theme that comes up again and again and again is that they have to tell the truth because it's central to their recovery. And if they lie, even about little things, um, they are going to relapse. And when they're in their addiction, they lie about a lot of things, not just hiding their use, but sort of things that don't even matter. I'll never forget one patient said to me, yeah, when I was using, if I was at Burger King and a friend called me, I'd say I was at McDonald's. If I was at McDonald's, I say, I'd say I was at Burger King. He said, it didn't make any sense, but I just <laughs> developed the lying habit. And so part of being in recovery is to stop lying. And what I do in that chapter is really try to dissect how, what it is about truth telling uh, that makes us better able to abstain, to delay gratification, and just to live better lives. And, and what I conclude is that number one, telling the truth fosters real intimacy between people, um, which again is counterintuitive because you think when people know our sort of inner struggles, they'll run for the hills, but in fact, the opposite is true. They come closer. But telling the truth also importantly allows us to tell the stories of our lives in a way that adheres closer to reality. And the reason this is so important is because the way that we tell our autobiographical narratives is not just the way that we understand our experiences, but also shapes future behavior. So for example, if we tell stories in which we're always the victim and never take responsibility for our actions, going forward, we will continue to be the victim. And the way that we tell that story actually will predict that phenomenon. Whereas if we tell stories where we can really elucidate both the ways that we've been victimized, but also the ways that we've victimized others, for example, or at least contributed to the problem, we're more likely to be able to come up with um, solutions that help us make better decisions going forward. The other thing that, that is really fascinating to me is that you know, as we talked about, um, addiction is probably this disconnect between the reward, the reward pathways in the brain, in the lower brain stem and the prefrontal cortex, um, our big gray matter area behind, uh, behind our, our foreheads. And truth telling, I hypothesize, actually helps activate the prefrontal cortex, our storytelling part of our brain, and helps us reconnect that prefrontal cortex with our lower brain stem and with our reward pathways so that those parts of the brains are, are, are talking to each other again, which is so fundamental uh, for recovery because we don't want our lizard brain to be dictating you know, what we're doing. Right, and it's, I guess, another way of honoring our yeah. brokenness. That's right. It's a way of saying, this is who I am. And, and, right. the other yeah, and the other thing that we talked about earlier was that we talked about how perhaps the addict has the psychology of this world isn't, exciting enough for me and i guess that lion is a way of reinforcing those pathways because if suddenly he's at burger king when he's right. actually in mcdonald's yeah. then it's like yeah. a cycle yeah that's true and yet if you think about if you want to do something really hard with your day today 
don't tell a single lie because we're all liars. We're natural right. liars. And to really go through your whole day and not lie about anything is really challenging and hard. So ironically, if you want a challenge, try to be a truth teller because you'll be a rare bird. But you're, you're, you're absolutely right about this kind of being truth telling also, and this is really important for this day and age, it allows us to be more authentically connected with our real selves and our real in the moment experiences, which also makes us feel more real. And in this day of social media and curated online profiles, this becomes really vital because what so many of us are falling prey to is curating these online personas that are not anything like our real selves. And of course, we have this very narcissistic culture which promotes that. So we end up experiencing what's called in psychiatry, derealization or depersonalization, which is a very scary feeling that like you're living in the matrix that I'm not real or the world's not real. And, and lying can really contribute to this feeling. Whereas telling the truth, even when it hurts, um, can really reconnect us to ourselves and make us feel real in the world, which I think is especially important right now. Right. And it's so, uh, sobering to, to hear those things. I, I would love to, I guess, ask you on this point, if there has been someone that has found themselves in the habit of telling lies, of uh, mistruths, and, and I guess there's many ways in which this could manifest itself, how would you advise them to, to start, to begin that process of honoring their brokenness and to start telling the truth? Well, actually, I prescribe truth telling. So when I when I prescribe a dopamine fast, I will also say to patients, you know, um, one of the ways since we've agreed that your goal this this month is to not use your drug of choice, um, one of the ways that you can help yourself do that is to not lie about anything, um, because we'll we'll agree that part of the drug use process is the lying that goes along with it. And so therefore part, part of the recovery process is the truth telling. So I'll, I'll just say that flat out like that. I'll prescribe it. I'll say, you know, the other thing is try not to lie about anything. Um, and, and patients generally get it right away because they do see on some gut level how using and lying are connected to each other. Right. And we think that people will run from the hills, but as you say, we're attracted to our rough edges. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. I love it. Um, I've just got one last question for you about your book, and then we'll sign off and you can signpost these guys wherever you'd like <laughs> to go. Um, I I know someone that did uh, like an Alcoholics Anonymous program. And to this day, when I speak to him about it, he gets, you know, glazy eyed. You know, it, it, it seems to me like a real spiritual experience. I've, I've never gone through anything like that. Uh, but looking in from the outside, it sounds like almost like cult like 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 it's uh you know I, I i'm not even sure how i could begin to describe it but i would love to know why does aa work so aa you know works through a number of different mechanisms um which have been written about you know for for a long time now things like creating a sober social network other people to hang out with who are not using um, the whole 12 steps, uh, the basic, you know, philosophy of the higher power and handing it over to a higher power. And those are all real and important mechanisms. But what, what I, what I hypothesize in my book is that one of the real crucial mechanisms is that, um, AA gets the shame equation, right. And many other social organizations don't. And what I mean by that is that, um, shame can be a vehicle by which people, continue in their addictions and don't, don't stop because the shame itself drives them to continue to use. And yet shame can also be the very same vehicle by which people get into recovery. Shame can be a highly pro-social emotion that it's good for us to experience. And AA has figured out how to do that. Being an AA is typically initially extremely de-shaming for people. They feel that they're not the only ones. They hear other stories. They, they don't feel just basically as ashamed for their behavior. But at the same time, AA has figured out how to use shame in terms of the commitment to the organization and the, and the process of doing the 12 steps as a way to motivate people to stay sober. And by that, I mean, is that many patients have told me that 
not the only thing, but one of the main reasons that they don't go back to using is because they would be mortified to go back to their AA group and have to say that they relapsed. And yet importantly, if, if they do relapse and they go back, they're welcomed with open arms. And this is really different from a lot of other social organizations, for example, like rel religious organizations, which will give lip service to embracing, you know, those of us who are struggling and broken. But when it comes right down to it, don't make a space for, for people like that in the church, because for true believers, there, they, there shouldn't be problems, right? Because grace will have given them a kind of a, you know, solution to everything. So, so AA does this amazing thing where it really gets that double-edged sort of shame, right? And, you know, the sort of glazed eyed look of your friend or the cultish, I mean, you know, um, people have said, well, I mean, people just get addicted to AA. And, and my reaction to that is, well, it's a pretty good addiction. You know, it's a place where you go and you're intimately connecting with other people. You're being real. Um, you know, you're sharing wisdom. That's not too bad. Right. right. And for many people, it's extremely humbling when they think that I'm the only person in the world that suffers with this to go to right. an environment where many other people. And this is what I loved about your book is that you bring stories that someone thinks it was just me. Apparently, it's not just me. So right. thank right. you so much for writing your book. Um, I just got a couple of questions left for you. Um, so you've obviously written uh, a couple of books now. Um, I'll we'll link both of those below. Um, outside of your own work, um, I, I'd be interested to know this question, given the types of books that you've talked about reading so far. <laughs> but what books have impacted your life the most? Oh, gosh, uh, that's a hard one. Um, you know, there is a book that I love called Clear and Simple as the Truth. And it's basically a writing book but I really feel that it says more than that. I think it's deeply philosophical and postulates that we can know the truth, which I think is a really exciting thought that it is actually possible for us with deep concentration and commitment to both know what is true and communicate that to another human being. So I really, really love that book. Um, Victor Frankl's Man's Search for Meaning had a huge impact on me, and I go back to it periodically. Um, that's a really, really powerful book. Um, there's a book called um, Going on Being, which is written by a psychiatrist who integrates um, his own Buddhist tradition with the practice of psychiatry. And that's been immeasurably helpful to me, both in my work and also in my life. So, so I would say those are three books off the top of my head uh, that I would say um, have impacted me. And I guess more broadly, I would also just say that books are really important to me and that when I'm reading a book that is um, impactful, it's probably a peak experience for me. I, it's like an intimate conversation with a really wise person that I just, it, it's um, really important, has been important in my life which is, I guess, why I wanted to write a book, hoping I could write a book like that for other people. And if I may pause it, you did. Oh, thank you. Nice. <laughs> my pleasure, my pleasure. Um, my last question for you, before I ask you to signpost these guys to wherever uh, you can, is what makes a life worth living? Hmm, a life worth living... I think really um, sense of meaning and purpose, giving back to others, um, loving and being loved, not happiness. That is not, uh, I think the goal and nor do I think it should be the goal. I mean, and even in, might even be orthogonal to the goal of a life worth living. I think being interconnected, being of service, um, living according to your values, that's really important. This has been such an information rich episode. Um, where would you like to signpost everyone that's listened to this point to? I don't even know what signpost means, which makes send me feel really send them somewhere, send them to your book, to your website, wherever you'd like them to go. Oh yeah, so um, I mean, prior to writing the book, I didn't even have a website, but yes, I, I have. A, I guess it's onalemke.com, but it's you know 
there's not much there. I don't know. Uh, your podcast. That's yes. what I would sign. Public. Leave it to the freedom <laughs> pack. We'll, we'll, send, we'll send them your way. There you uh, go. Yeah, but I want to pay my gratitude to you at the end of this episode because you've been doing fantastic work for a long time, really meaningful work. The stories in your book were fantastic. Uh, I'm so, so grateful for you coming on the show. And I loved speaking to you, and I cannot wait to get this episode. So, Anna, thank you so much for coming on. Oh, you're welcome. Thank you for your gratitude and your, your own honesty and disclosure. I really appreciate it. It's a gift to me.